The Graduate and Professional Student Senate present Working for Washington's Future, Meeting Employer Demand in the Coming Decade, a two-part series that discusses the critical need for investment in graduate and professional degree production in Washington State. This program is brought to you in part by Technology Alliance, Prosperity Partnership, the University of Washington Graduate School, and the Office of the Vice Provost for Student Life. So joining me up here are uh, Dr. Matt O'Donnell, who's the Dean of the University of Washington College of Computer Science, of College of Engineering. It says Computer Science on my notes, but it's the whole College of Engineering. Yeah, yeah, he, he did. You know, he's, he's been working on that computer, and he's already modified my notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also have with us, uh, to uh, Matt's left, Mike Denton, who's Vice President of Engineering for Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And we have Rob Arnold, who's President and Chief Operating Officer of Geospisa. So uh, these three gentlemen are going to be um, uh, hopefully furthering the conversation that we've already heard. I'm just going to give you a few comments on each of them, and uh, then we'll jump in. And Matt O'Donnell is not an engineer, even though he's the dean of engineering at the University of Washington. So what's up with that? Someone let a physicist in the door. Uh, he said the first engineering class he attended was the first one that he taught uh, in electrical engineering. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to recruit him from the uh, University of Michigan, which is uh, a, a competitor in many ways, but also a school that's doing a great job of uh, cranking out uh, people in the United States that are supporting uh, the economy of Michigan uh, and the economy of the U.S., but we are delighted that uh, we were able to recruit him away, and he won uh, teaching awards there and has been doing a great job uh, since he's come here, and I'm watching him because I'm an alum of his department, as was uh, mentioned earlier. Um, Mike Denton is uh, VP of Engineering, Boeing Commercial Airplanes, as I mentioned. He is an engineer uh, with an electrical engineering degree and also an MBA. Uh, his responsibilities include workforce development and engineering hiring to support the different business units of Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And uh, he's been with the Boeing Company for 29 years. And we know what's happening with the 787 Dreamliner. We're very proud of uh, our uh, local company here. Uh, I know the headquarters in Chicago, but we haven't let go yet. Um, the jobs are still mostly here. The need for engineering and graduate degrees is still mostly here, and so we're going to hear from Mike about that. And Rob Arnold, President and Chief Operating Officer of GeoSpisa, uh, has a, also has a business degree, yeah. because, right? Um, he is, uh, has been involved with a number of startup uh, technology and life science type businesses uh, over the course of his career. Uh, from security solutions for broadband providers and applications to 250-person uh, software testing and QA lab to his current work um, with GeoSpisa, which is uh, delivering DNA sequencing, workflow analysis, and data management software for life sciences researchers. So he depends on life sciences research for his uh, current company. So we know why he wants more graduates, uh, graduate degrees. Um, so these, this is our distinguished panel, and uh, we're really delighted that... Uh, they are here. And um, I'm sure actually all of you probably have some thoughts based on what you've heard and things where you would like to have, would have liked to have raised your hand and made some points. So instead of me kind of going through my scribbled out questions, I'm just going to kick this out to you and say, what would you like to say based on the conversation that we just heard with uh, Brad Smith and with Ann Daly um, that you'd like to add to some of the questions that were asked or the thoughts that they provided? So any one of you can start. Uh, I'll, I'll start on one thing because I've heard this, uh, so I've been about 18 months here, and the one thing I've heard which I found a little shocking sometimes is what's so bad with importing all the talent, right? It's, it is they come into the state, this is, has to be good for the state. So I came from a state where two-thirds of the graduates of uh, uh, engineering left the state with their degree. Uh, you don't want to get in a position like that, obviously. But the other side is, is when you're importing, it's just like the dependence that you have in, deport, you know, in importing oil or any other resources, is when you become dependent on somebody else, you don't control your own destiny. And uh, I don't think it's appreciated in my travels this year, I don't think it's been appreciated how we're such a critical state right now of how many people we're importing and that we can simply not do it. I think Brad, when he was talking, uh, this morning, uh, I found very disturbing that there's a couple hundred engineers sitting up in Vancouver that should be sitting across the lake here uh, in Seattle. I think that's going to be a critical issue as we go uh, as we go forward. Okay. 
Thanks, Matt. So, Other thoughts? Yeah. I was going to say I would I agree with that. Uh, I think the reason why GOSB is here this morning, uh, represented by myself, is I think we're really a sneak preview of the types of businesses that we can really uh, build here in the state. Um, our business is uh, building information technology systems to automate genetic analysis. This is really at the foundation of what's going to be happening in uh, uh, personalized and predictive medicine. Variation analysis is what we really try to understand. Um, I did a little research on GeoSpeza. We're still a small company. We're about 21 employees. Uh, but uh, I found that 75% uh, of our employees have graduate degrees. 50% uh, are actual PhDs. And of those 50%, 50% of the uh, uh, PhDs actually came from the University of Washington. So I'd like to thank the University of Washington for GeoSpeza right. wouldn't exist uh, <laughs> without it. But what was really interesting to me is that uh, of, of our employees, 90% uh, uh, were actually brought into the state. Um, so they were actually brought here for the graduate level education, uh, meaning that only 10% are native Washingtonians. Um, my fear uh, going forward, especially with this type of business, because it really is a, a brand new business and a brand new field, although the, our business has been around for a little while, but, but being a brand new field, is that if there's a continuing dependency on being able to import talent, uh, Dr. Emmert uh, quite eloquently stated how much global competition is out there uh, for this talent. Uh, my greatest fear is whether or not we can recruit these people in, and if we can't, we have to be producing them here. Otherwise, a business like GeoSpeza just simply can't exist. So that's, a, that's an observation that I've had. Rob, what, what, uh, what kinds of graduate degrees make up your, your current and your projected workforce? So uh, current, uh, we have uh, certainly molecular biologists, uh, computer science, uh, physicists. Uh, we have mathematicians, statisticians. Uh, so it's a pretty, uh, this is really a convergence type of field. We can't rely on just simply one discipline to get the work done. Uh, and right now, it does require uh, graduate level education to do these particular uh, type of uh, projects that we take on. And so uh, for our business, again, we really do see ourselves as kind of a sneak preview of the future. Uh, we are going to require these types of skill sets to move forward. Great. Thanks. Mike, thoughts? Thank you very much, Sally. Um, Boeing is one of those companies that is importing engineers to the state. And uh, this, is a, this has been a wonderful morning for me, although I must admit, having listened to Sally and Ann and Brad, all of my anxieties have been magnified. Um, we have such a challenge in front of us uh, as a state and also as a country when we think about where we need to go uh, in terms of fulfilling the high-tech job openings that will be out there in this country in the next five years. So just talking about Boeing, um, today we employ about 33,000 engineers. 15% of those people are retirement eligible now. Um, further, in the last five years, we've had an opportunity to grow as a company. We've had some exciting products to work on, both in commercial with the 787, but also on our defense side of our business. And if I think forward around commercial, we think the 787 is the start of a new family of airplanes, so we're very excited about a continuing journey. So not only do we have this concern about attrition of really skilled people that are going to retire, we've had a need to grow and attract more talent against a backdrop of an industry, the aerospace industry in this country, that has generally contracted over the last 20 years, so less and less people available to us from other businesses, which means we have to turn our attention more and more towards um, institutions like the University of Washington, Washington State, and other universities around the country and around the world, if we could bring them here, to fill our needs. So a tremendous demand for, for really great talent. Um, in the long term, we are facing an ever more competitive business. 30 years ago plus, uh, the countries of Europe got together and decided to found Airbus, and they did it because they wanted to bring high-tech jobs to Europe. And they've been very successful, and today they are a tremendous competitor, a very resilient competitor, and they will be a challenge for us going forward. If you look in Russia, 
Um, President Putin has said that the aerospace industry is one that is going to be a national focus for Russia. In China, in the last three months, the, that country has said their desire is to get into commercial aviation in a big way, and they want to produce large jetliners and be more self-reliant than they are today. So we see ever more competition in a global arena where 70 percent of our business resides today. So it's, it's all about uh, competitive survival. And to, be, and to be successful, we are going to need a higher and higher proportion of very skilled engineers that are able to work in a multicultural environment that will have advanced degrees greater than the current quantity of advanced degrees with, that we have today. Today it's about 25 percent of our Puget Sound engineers have advanced degrees, either masters or doctorates. Um, I believe that that will change and will have to be higher if we are going to be successful. So we have huge challenges that just put lots and lots of pressure on um, our state and the needs of our state to produce highly capable technical workers for us. Thanks. So um, raise your hand if you have a question. We'll get the mics to you. And while I'm asking this next one, uh, Matt, I'm going to push on you a little bit. Oh, sure, um, it's sure. It's dang hard to get into engineering. You know, when I was there, it was pretty easy, so they let me in. Yeah. But it, <laughs> it's not so easy anymore. And um, there are a lot more people that want to be engineers, particularly computer scientists, than we let uh, into that program. It's highly competitive. Grades have to be good. Pretty intimidating, I think, for students who may be inclined that way but feel like they can't make the grade. So uh, what do we need to do, not just at the University of Washington, but also across the state, to increase the capacity? Uh, because clearly there are people that desire these jobs that uh, the business people on the podium are talking about, and yet um, we're not letting as many in that have a desire. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, pipeline issue is huge. Uh, because as, as we've seen, uh, as the demand for engineers and computer scientists goes up, is the fraction of our population that is prepared coming into universities to, to uh, take those disciplines is going down. Uh, and so obviously something has to give uh, or else we're going to start uh, having kids go elsewhere for their uh, education. So um, I, I, I know I have, I'll throw out something. Uh, there was talk about the uh, immigration laws as one thing at the high level. I think there's something at the pipeline level that we really have to look at and that's the concept of a uniform curriculum. If we have uh, variability in what our kids are being prepared, mm -hmm. just based on what school district they're in, mm -hmm. uh, where certain school districts are producing kids that are able to compete, but many school districts are not, how are we serving? Mm -hmm. How are we serving our kids right? So if there's any one thing I think that we should be looking at in the pipeline issue is this concept of a uniform curriculum to make sure that our kids are prepared to be going into computer science and engineering uh, disciplines. One of the things that concerns me is that looking around the, the country, it seems that most of the biotech jobs seem to be in, in Boston and San Diego and San Francisco. I want to know, what's the prognosis for the biotech industry in Seattle? We have work to do. Uh, it's, I think there's still a major challenge to be able to effectively transition from technology to product. And that really is something where you have to, and technology is not product. You, you, put a lot of energy and effort to reduce technology into something that can be consumable and generate revenue. Um, this is probably one of the bigger challenges that, uh, that really exists here in the state. We're very good at innovating new technology, uh, but the talent to be able to then take that technology and commercialize it, uh, we have a recruitment effort on that side as well. We need to bring more talent in that has that experience. Yeah, th this is somewhat related to the question that was just asked. I really enjoyed Brad Smith's uh, discussion of the, of the infotech industry and then the biotech industry. But, but one of the things he didn't mention, and this is really a question from Mike, I guess, Matt O'Donnell and I have talked about it. In fact, we talked about it while we were recruiting Matt. And that is that Washington's still a state where we build stuff. You know, we haven't given up on manufacturing. And Boeing, of course, is the, the dominant example of that. But we also build a lot of other high-end products in the, in, the, uh, bio, in the biotechnology arena, but predominantly around medical devices and a handful of other things. Uh, I really hope that that continues to be a very vibrant part of our economy, not just because it's good for the economy, but I, I, I'd hate to think the United States just 
throws up its hands and says, we design stuff, but we can't build things here. W when you go over to Germany, they still build a lot of really great things in Germany, and their, and their costs of production are very high, including airplanes, but also automobiles and machinery. And I've been through your factories. You've got a lot of German machines in your machine shops. And, and so he here's a nation that has uh, very high costs, but, but pretty good margins, and they're doing great businesses and actually still building stuff. Uh, and, and it seems to me that one of the key differences there is, in fact, their education system. They have a wonderful combination of high-end innovative R&D built around graduate education, but they also have a really marvelous skilled cra trades and craftsmanship model that we seem to have given up on. And, and, and my sense is, but I want you to tell me whether I'm right or wrong, is that we need to do both of those things. We've got to build the innovation end with our graduate and professional education. And we also have to worry about getting much more highly trained uh, techn technical workers who can work on the shop floor and who can, who can take the ideas of our innovation workers and turn it into stuff that we actually use every day. Where, where do you see the manufacturing industry going, Mike, and, and how does the UW and especially our graduate and professional programs fit into that? Um, boy, Mark, you're, you're right on the mark. I was talking to my peer um, that leads the manufacturing process and um, um, the hiring activities for manufacturing in BCA just uh, earlier this week. She commented that in 2007, we are going to hire something on the order of 5,000 um, mechanics, shop floor technicians to help in assembly of our airplanes and uh, do a lot of the technical work. And she said more than ever, that, that new incoming force is less equipped to do the, the high-tech work and the assembly that ne we need them to do than ever before. So we need to develop um, the apprenticeship programs internally uh, and work with some of the trade schools in the area to um, do a much better job of making those people ready to go to work because um, we're, just, we're not in the state we need to be, not in the condition we need to be. Please. I've seen, again, in Germany, educational models where there's, and most of them are driven in a very different way than we do here, between the large corporations uh, and higher education and the technical schools in combination so that they, they literally have people working in advanced engineering, working in a continuous web between advanced engineering, design, and technical education all Doing, doing apprenticeship models and educational models together so that the, the craftsman on the floor, you know, that, that highly skilled mechanic, actually talk to the guy that helped design the thing that he's gonna, or she's going to build, and the, and the person who's doing the high-end design listens to what the person on the floor says and says, you know, yeah, that's a cool design, but I can't put it together, and vice versa. And, and, you know, we don't have, at least no place I've seen in the United States, do we have a model that tries to integrate that? And I think that's one of the real keys to Germany maintaining its manufacturing base, whereas in Michigan, we, we've watched it just disappear, and we don't seem to be able to build an automobile worth a darn. Boy, you know, great, great, sorry, go ahead. Well, great comments. I, I guess I haven't, I can't talk about um, what you've seen in Germany. I know that in some respects we're doing some good things at Boeing relative to our Boeing production system and trying to bring engineers closer to the factory floor to engage with their manufacturing counterparts so that we really get a good understanding of how we're trying to build things so that we can think that through better as we engineer the product up front. Um, but being ready to actually do the fundamentals of the build is an area where um, we're just seeing a greater need. So we have our learning, training, and development organization that works with um, engineering departments and universities to collaborate, collaborate on developing new courses that help our existing workforce as well as um, collaborate on new curriculum needs. Um, I think we're going to do similar kinds of things and similar kinds of external teaming to try to work on the training needs of our factory personnel. Um, but that's going to evolve, I think, over the next year. Can I add something there? Uh, uh, one of the things, and Mark, I've thought about this uh, a lot when you see this continuum 
that, that you're describing, is one of the statistics that really scares me a lot is the basic mathematics skills that we have of our students coming out. Because your concept of the old school technician who goes around with a couple you know, screwdrivers in the back pocket and, uh, and uh, uh, the belt, uh, is really, you know, 50 years old. Now it's a lot of computer controlled uh, equipment. And if you want to have that kind of conversation, you have to have a math level for just the people who are, are at the tech level, uh, which is pretty sophisticated and pretty high. And we continue to go backwards in our uh, basic mathematics skills just for your average high school graduate. So let alone the top end we're talking about, it's the mid grade, which is really as worrisome as well if we want to have this continuum. You know, there's a point that Governor Gregoire made earlier this week. She had the regents and trustees from the various uh, um, universities around the state together, and she made a point that even your basic uh, construction trade jobs that require really basic skills in math, like being able to cut on an angle and being able to measure and so on, are not being met by uh, the students that are graduating from high school. I'm not talking about people who aren't graduating, these who are graduates. and. One of the things I think we need to think about, and it's a bit of a uh, um, you know, interesting paradigm for the technology industry, is kids are spending less time doing things like hammering nails and cutting uh, bits and pieces and taking things apart and exploring than perhaps a generation ago. So some of the applied tools, and you can use it in cooking for that matter as well in terms of doubling or having recipes. Uh, those things are not being done by kids today in terms of how they're spending their spare time and technology is a factor in that as well. So I think helping raise awareness of just the need of these basic skills and part of it is at the foot of education but part of it is at the foot of how we're raising children today that I think uh, has an impact. Ed. So I just wanted to make three what I promise will be very brief comments. The first relates to Mark's point and I just want to emphasize that Microsoft manufactures things. Yes. And Microsoft exemplifies a trend in which the contents of the goods we manufacture are increasingly intellectual and decreasingly physical. And the same is true of Boeing. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Boeing's mm -hmm. products have more and more intellectual content and more and more of the production of the physical content is in fact offshored for a variety of very good reasons. So if you think about the vanguard of the economy here, it's moving in a direction in which the goods we manufacture have physical content. Uh, sorry, excuse me, intellectual content and less physical content. And it's all manufacturing. Microsoft builds systems whose complexity rivals the complexity of the systems that Boeing has been building for 50 years. Um, and it's all sort of engineering and manufacturing. The second is you asked Matt a question about capacity and he responded very importantly in terms of pipeline, but there are capacity issues as well. The strong graduate programs at the University of Washington are oversubscribed by a factor of 10 at the graduate level. That's certainly true for computer science and engineering. It's true for bioengineering, for many other programs. And this year, for example, computer science and engineering was able to expand, but by only half of what we sought. So there's a real capacity issue at, at all levels. That's not to say that we don't need to work more on pipeline and more on student interest. Uh, the final point I wanted to make is to come back to something Mark said in his introduction. He talked about Washington kids washing the cars. And mm -hmm. I think we have a panel here that's providing the business perspective and it's critical that Washington State businesses be able to grow and thrive and that new businesses be able to be created. Um, but we also have to look at this from the point of view of the opportunity for kids who grow up in Washington. So because we have one of the nation's top software industries, the truth is we're always going to be a net importer of talent. Otherwise, the kids who grew up in Kansas would have nothing to do. Uh, but the important thing is that every kid who grows up in Washington State who has the inclination to do this sort of thing has the educational opportunity to prepare him or herself for it. And so I think that that opportunity issue is apt to relate to the parents in the state who may not care as much about how the companies are doing, although, uh, although obviously economic development is important. Can, can I, yeah, I want to comment on the last point. Uh, you, uh, again, I came from a, a net exporter 18 months ago. You don't want to be an exporter of your, of your talent. You never want to be in a situation uh, where it's like that. But the ratio of imports is really important. So I've made all the comparisons in the last year or so of looking to California. So California, obviously, Silicon Valley and, and the Southern California aerospace industries and the like. And you say, okay, what do they, where are they? And they import, right. But they import about three times less than we do. So you saw that number there, the absolute number comparing California to Washington. Divide by the state populations, 
right? And you understand what's going on. So this is not, again, you want to be a net importer, but you don't want to be dependent on, a, you know, a very unstable situation, which is where we are right now. So, right. so talk about the, Ed said, you know, it takes one in 10, basically, people who want to be in graduate education in computer science and engineering. And I'm sure there's, you know, similar statistics for, for others of these high demand fields. What, what do we do about that? I mean, we do have to increase some capacity. Uh, there's no doubt uh, about that. Uh, but capacity, you know, building capacity isn't as easy as saying, I'll give you a few extra bucks and you take on some more students, because there has to be an infrastructure right. exactly. uh, associated with that uh, to do that. Actually, I think, uh, at least just speaking parochially for the College of Engineering and, and where computer science uh, is also part of, uh, that our facilities issues and infrastructure issues are, are the biggest issue right now. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, new faculty and high quality students is it. But if we want to grow to meet some of these uh, capacity issues, is our facilities at the rate limiting step right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can certainly add just from the business perspective that um, uh, we do think a lot about uh, our particular uh, business being located here in Washington State for that very reason. Because if we know that we're totally dependent on having uh, basically a recruitment only strategy in, uh, that's actually, uh, one, it's incredibly expensive. Number two, uh, it actually puts us at greater risk because of global competition issues. Uh, if we're not producing uh, uh, folks with the skill sets that we need, we have to seriously look at can we even be viable here right. uh, over the long term. Right, thanks. We'll go there and then we'll come back to you. Ken? Hi, my name is Ken Meyer, and I lead the WSA, which is the Technology Industry Association here in Washington. I want to first thank everyone for coming and doing this event, which is phenomenal. Uh, my question is, uh, 10 years ago, I was a volunteer on the WSA board. I worked for IBM, and we did a workforce study, and, in, and I did it with Ed. And it uh, feels like deja vu all over again. And uh, at that time, it was just as the bubble was really peaking, and there was a severe supply-demand gap. And the legislature responded, and incremental capacity was added. And in the last year, it feels like the same discussion is reminiscent of almost a decade ago. The legislature has responded, and incremental capacity has been provided. But at both times, uh, we talked about exponential problems, not incremental problems. And so I wonder if I could challenge the board. You're all experienced uh, business leaders. You inspire uh, your teams by having a vision and by communicating that vision. How do we harness the greater community to get behind some vision uh, that has us really make exponential advances? Is that, is that what it'll, it'll take? How do we move the ball exponentially forward? Well, that was a tall question. <laughs> I think we're both looking at Mike there. Yeah, Mike, go for it. So, so I like, um, there's no epiphany, and I don't think there's a magic pill. Sally talked about how do you inspire an electorate where only 37% of the 25 to 34 year olds have a higher education degree and only 40% of the more senior population in the state? So those of us that are advocating for more college you know, degrees, four year and up degrees, are in the minority. So how do you change the perception of everybody else that this is really important and that our future competitiveness and standard of living is dependent on it. Um, it's not easy because there's a culture out there that says what they're doing and what their children have done is okay. And at the Boeing Company, we've learned after trying many different kinds of initiatives over the years and, and failing miserably that we adopted a saying, or at least some of us did, that culture eats strategy for lunch. It's really hard mm -hmm. to change culture and it takes, it takes constancy of purpose it takes kind of a groundswell. It means that people like yourselves that, that get it start talking about it not only with your f friends and family that also get it, but also to your friends that might not get it. Why isn't your, why isn't your son going to school? Why is it that your daughter is no longer interested in math and science at seventh grade? Nationally, how many how many women graduate with engineering degrees? It's less than twenty percent, right, Matt? Tiny. Uh, no, it's a little above twenty. But you're right. It's a little right. above. Okay, yeah, right. so it's really low. I mean, it should be, it should be better. At Boeing, we would like to hire a very diverse workforce. That's, um, uh, what's the right word? That's consistent with our society. So we would. I would love to have a workforce that's 
um, got equal populations of African Americans, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, and women in the workforce, and we don't have it today. And it's really hard to, to get where we'd like to be. So it takes time, and it just takes us talking about it all the time, being, being um, outspoken in the legislature, people like Bob Watt at Boeing, um, and people like all of you. And it's going to take time, but we've, we've really got to do it. And it starts not just with graduate level, it starts with K through 12. I mean, it's fundamentals. You know, it's interesting on the on the vision side of uh, you know how can you take all these complex issues and kind of galvanize them together under one one roof, so to speak. Um, you know, I go back when I was growing up; it was the space race. So there was this uh, drive to get to the moon, and that galvanized folks together that brought all multidisciplinary talents to go achieve a common goal. The derivative of that is that you produce technologies that, you know, we've lived off of for quite a while. Um, in Washington State, I could definitely see something along the lines of personalized medicine and galvanizing behind a central theme and then having the, the different parts come together. It pulls together complex issues like, you know, graduate education and, and so forth. But I think we do need to get some kind of vision out there for the state that can actually bring some of these complex issues together. Uh, one quickie was uh, when Brad was talking about this uh, this morning, I think, Lee, your question about historical perspective. But then if you look at these things, almost always when there's exponential growth, there's crisis, right? So there was uh, Second World War, crisis, sur the survival of the culture, right? And then Sputnik, the survival of the species because of the worry about uh, the space race. And so it's to get exponential change, somehow there has to be a crisis. Now, there is a crisis in fact, but it's just quiet and it's not as, I don't, you know, if someone had the magic bullet out there which could, t uh, could express it in a way that to show that we really are in crisis, this is not just a, a small problem. Until we do that, we're only gonna get an incremental change. We're not gonna get exponential growth. I actually have a magic bullet I'd like to sh suggest. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> thank All right. And, and it's uh, short of a crisis because crises aren't fun. No. And this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at Ken and Ed right. with this because I think our, uh, absent a crisis, because it's kind of death by a thousand cuts right now, yes. uh, is marketing, right? Marketing can be very effective. So if Ken's uh, technology companies who are producing incredibly engaging, one might say addicting products in the technology sector that are absorbing young people, um, and those technology products are being enjoyed by some very smart people who may not be broadening their minds to be able to produce those products in the future, then what can the technology sector be doing making engaging products that re-engage children in math and in science and in technology? Technology is becoming portable. You don't have to be inside. You don't have to be playing uh, Grand Theft Auto. I won't pick on Halo 3 because that's a local company. <laughs> but um, what can we be doing in the technology industry to use marketing and engagement of these technology products that are so uh, pervasive among our young people and provide such an opportunity for marketing? What can we do with the industry to solve this problem using the very tools that are, um, I think, part of the challenge that our young people have today when it comes to um, really getting a fundamental understanding of math and science that they might have been doing when they were cutting wood and looking at pond water under a microscope. So um, actually, we need to go here to the gentleman in the gray shirt because I promised him the next question. And then we'll come back to you, Bill. And then I think, uh, Susanna, you have one over there. So can we get a mic here? No, you can't because we're recording it. So we need a mic back over here. Where's that second mic? It's back over here. Okay, so let's go there. Uh, thank you. I'm John Whitaker. Uh, UW Chemi PhD grad from 2003, uh, CTO of Modu Metal, a revolutionary metal composites company. Um, <clears throat> that was an ad, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question, I guess, I'm surprised nobody has mentioned it. Uh, it was brought up how much money the university brings in in federal dollars, uh, excess of $1 billion. Uh, dollars. Um, but yet we're last among the, the global challenge states in, in um, uh, talent in terms of upper level degrees. Uh, I was wondering if anybody could comment on that, I guess specifically uh, sure. Dean O'Donnell, and what it means to 
being a research institution and an educational institution? Sure. Uh, I think it's a, um, it's a major issue. Uh, our graduate programs here are much smaller than uh, they should be given the size of the research, uh, research base. But if you compare it to other institutions around the country, the ones that have the major, uh, 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 you know, have funding which is comparable to our level, if a little bit less, but have much larger graduate programs, usually what they have is they have a safety net, a fairly significant safety net uh, that is provided that uh, allows for fluctuations in funding. Because as you know, if you went through a PhD program uh, here, the money comes and goes based on what uh, the entrepreneurship of individual faculty and success of individual faculty. So it's those fluctuations that you have, you need some kind of uh, uh, support behind it to smooth them out. We don't have a lot of that right now. It's something we're working on uh, definitely for the future. But until we have that, we are going to always have smaller graduate programs than what our research support should justify without that smoothing function. I want to add one other thing, too. He's talked about PhD. The other part is master's, is, is our master's program, at least in engineering, uh, has been relatively flat for a long time. And this is an area we, I think we really have to focus on in the short term because all the disciplines, I heard it from Mike, what you were saying, uh, what we heard with the Google statistics and other things, is the fraction of jobs that are going towards master's degrees are going way up. Uh, so the, the, the one to me is the oldest professional society, American Society of Civil Engineers, has just recently said that the master's degree is the preferred degree now for the professional mm -hmm. exam. So even the oldest form of, a credit, you know, of credentialing in engineering is gonna move towards a master's degree, and we gotta respond to that. Any comments from the panel before we go to the next question? Okay, great. Go ahead, Bill. <coughs> On the, um, we've been talking here a lot about the pipeline and the, what I'd call the supply side of this issue. Uh, there's also uh, an interesting uh, uh, demand side take on this. Uh, we've heard from employers who have, have uh, uh, are offering, I'm sure, attractive salaries and, and bringing, uh, having, s seeing that they have excess demand and not able to fill all their slots. But if we look at, at uh, the math and science teacher, the sort of chronic shortage in math and science teaching, and if we look at uh, life sciences nationally and many of the science uh, and, and math fields nationally, we see that uh, the, on the, uh, uh, there's evidence coming out uh, increasingly, you're, you're seeing this in Congress, you're seeing National Academy reports and so on that, that say science uh, and, and math salaries have not been growing very fast. It takes a very long time to get a PhD in, in uh, one of these fields. Uh, to get an MBA is two years after an undergraduate degree, three years for a law degree. Science and math fields aren't competitive in that sense, uh, and, and we've got, we're sort of pushing on a string in terms of working the supply side uh, and when, in fact, these fields don't, don't uh, look so attractive to U.S. students uh, anymore. And then all of a sudden we can't import as many uh, international students as we could before, and then we have a, a big problem. So I think the demand side needs attention, too. Thoughts on that, especially from the business uh, panelists? You paying more? Uh. <laughs> yeah, well, we definitely uh, pay very competitively uh, in the area. I think the... Uh, um, some of the challenges we've had is uh, not only having the deep technical skill, but also finding folks that have uh, the commercial interests, basically, understand or have at least some experience with, uh, you know, what it is to be part of a business. And so that ultimately becomes the most attractive candidate to us if they've got the deep technical knowledge, uh, but also not necessarily an MBA, but some exposure to uh, some of the issues regarding running a business and what it is to have, you know, basic management training, et cetera. Um, and for those particular individuals, yeah, we pay a very high premium and we'll continue to do so. I, I agree with your comments. We, we, uh, we bench ourselves against industry uh, every year to kind of see where we are and we, we do our very best to be competitive. Um, it's fundamental to getting the people you need. And then working with Matt in the College of Engineering uh, uh, at the University of Washington, they've been very open about working with Washington, or univer with working with Boeing, excuse me, to um, constantly explore how the curriculum has to evolve to meet our needs in industry. And I know that industry is part of the problem because 
I, I do not relent in terms of saying these classes can go away. I'm typically on the side of the scale of we need you to develop this kind of curriculum in addition to. And so we are constantly raising the bar and pushing Matt towards ever higher uh, curriculum requirements and coursework that you know, drives you to a five-year degree, which doesn't exactly help with throughput. So I know we're part of the problem. Um, I don't have any answers other than that we keep talking. Can I add just one thing? There's a fine point, but I think is very, very important, too, is, is to talk about graduate education. It's really, at least in engineering, uh, uh, two pieces, the master's level and the PhD level. PhD comments, I think, are, are germane to engineering as well as the other sciences. Master's is very different. Okay, the master's in engineering is probably the best educational dollar spent. Your lifelong earning, your payback time is something like 18 months. What educational dollar has a payback time of, uh, of 18 months? And to Mike's point, we have put together a number of professional master's programs, uh, long-standing one in computer science and technical communications, and newer ones, which we have in medical engineering and bioengineering, and now in electrical engineering, primarily to service uh, these guys uh, in Boeing. So I think at that level, it, it's very, very attractive. But the PhD level, there is the issue in engineering as well. The, the demand side is where my question comes because I think we've kind of had this impression that there's, you know, people are just banging down the door trying to get into all our engineering programs and they're oversubscribed. And, and I happen to know that, you know, that there are, there are a few where that's the case. But there's really, there are, we do have some excess capacity now, I believe, in some engineering programs. And I guess my challenge would be, and my question would be, how can we get more of the students that are going to college to really think about engineering? I mean, I think there's a kind of a market marketing challenge for engineering um, and getting, you know, the kids that end up becoming sociology majors like my daughter to think about an engineering or a science career because, we, you know, we're producing lots and lots of people in sociology, we're producing lots of people in um, what, leisure and recreation, I think that was the fastest growing major. So, I mean, we're, we're overproducing people. She in likes some, that. Which I know. <laughs> they all go to work for REI. but. That there, that there's a, there is a real need to help educate people going to college about where the real opportunities are and where the economy is going so that we can align the demand for students with what the demand for the economy is. So I'd like your guys' comments on that. Okay. Speedy comments? I'll take a quick. Uh, uh, engineers are historically not very good marketers. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's very clear uh, that we got to get a hell of a lot better uh, in marketing because if you look at the lifestyle that an engineer has in terms of travel, the people you're working with, you know, all the, forget the money, just all those other pieces, it is incredible. If you told that to a, a 14 or a 15 year old, they'd salivate. Uh, but we don't do that. We don't market, it has not been marketed. It's more like, well, if you want a good paying job, you know, and work with a solid industry, then you go become an engineer. And that's really not the best way to market it. Uh, so we do have a marketing issue, no doubt about it. Embedded in video games, I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, it's a marketing issue. I know as an engineer I didn't market well with my son because he has his degree in biology. But uh, I think it's also something that as parents we just have to encourage our children to keep at it because I don't think math and science are necessarily easy. Mm -hmm. um, so as parents we need to encourage our children to, to keep at it and to grow in those areas. And then back to the comments about needing good educators, I think that's absolutely true. Well-paid educators at the K through 12 level, as well as strong curriculum. So all the work that we can do to make our curriculum stronger and serve the needs and be interesting, and then have educators that can deliver it, I think that's uh, really a great focus for us. Thank you. Marketing and technology are, are one way to get this done. I want to say how encouraging it is to see our elected officials taking copious notes on the comments that are being taken because I know they'll take the message back. Yes, Senator Fraser. Well, hi, I'm Karen Fraser, State Senator. My district is the Olympia area and uh, I chair the capital budget process in the Senate. So I took uh, significant uh, notes and thoughts on items that show up in the capital budget. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who made this a fabulous morning, most informative and most stimulating and thought-provoking. And uh, 
I appreciate those who've noted that in the past, the legislature has tried to respond. Actually, 60% of the state's general budget goes to education of all forms, all levels. And uh, a large proportion of the, the, the bonding capacity of the state goes to uh, education buildings. And, uh, and we are investing in branch campuses as a response to uh, people who've uh, noted the need for more education and the most recent one is we're going to establish a new branch at, in the Snohomish County which deals with a lot of access issues uh, for people living uh, in that region of the state. Uh, the main word I'm taking away from all of this discussion today is alignment. Alignment meaning uh, connecting the dots meaning recognizing that the shoulder bone is connected to the ankle bone ultimately and the need to align education goals and programs and priorities with educational ones. But that also means we have to align a lot of other things, mm -hmm. you know, not only within the educational world and between uh, education and uh, the economy. For example, does the eco do economic policies of the state align with education? Do the economic policies of the state align with workforce training policies? Do those align with our infrastructure investments? And we have a lot of advocacy for infrastructure that doesn't align with, with what we've been talking about today. And then we also have to look at how this aligns with our state tax policy and our state tax policy is regressive. So when you talk about the culture of the state, a lot of people say, I'm gonna pay more, but am I gonna get any? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna pay more than the people who, who are gonna get the most benefit out of this. So this is part of the culture. And then every session, we have all kinds of people, including a lot of businesses who, who say, our priority is a tax break. And so I think we need, I would challenge everybody to think about what's a better investment? Is it a tax break? for a specific business or is it an investment in our educational structure? So uh, there's, there's an awful lot and also in terms of a lot of kids, they have troubled families, troubled homes. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece of the alignment. So, you know, it all goes together and I, so the word I'm taking away is alignment and I encourage all of you to do that too. Thank you very much, Senator. And uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel and uh, all of you for your great questions. I don't think I'll do a wrap if time was. And uh, so I'd like to welcome back up our student leaders who just did a great job of organizing this. And they won't ask us to thank them, so let's thank them as they come back up for this great morning. Let me just take a minute to, since we're, we're literally at 11 o'clock, I'm so proud we're on time, um, to, to just reiterate Sarah's thanks, my thanks to our distinguished panel, to Ann Daly for her tremendous leadership with the HEC board, to Dr. Mark Emmert, to Brad Smith, uh, to Sally Jewell, and to uh, Senator Frazier, Representative uh, Summers, and uh, Bob Hasegawa in the back. Thank you so much, sir, for, for being here and, and for, for just giving us your morning, because we do know how important this issue is, but we also know how busy your schedules are. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to close by, by reiterating that, that this is an issue that the Graduate and Professional Student Senate takes so very seriously, because it literally is talking about the future of our state. And for many of us who, who come to the University of Washington as the premier public university in this, in this state, uh, this isn't just about a degree, but it's also about making a home and making a name and making a profession for ourselves in the Pacific Northwest and in Washington, and investing in our communities, investing in ourselves, investing in our families. And I think Dr. Emmert said it so best when he said that it would be a tragic day if the sons and daughters of Washington were the people who were working for others who come, uh, but don't necessarily call our state their homes. So as we move forward in, in this supplemental budget year, and as we move forward into the more long-term uh, discussions with the legislature and with the leadership in this room and outside of this room, I just want to reiterate our call to action, our challenge to each of us to really think about the kinds of meaningful and substantive investments we must take to ensure that we're meeting an employer demand in the coming decade, to ensure that we're making the right investments, not only in our K-12 education, but also our BA and our graduate professional degree productions. These are literally the questions of our time, the questions for us 
for my generation, of ensuring that this state, this country, will continue to be a preeminent power in the global economy. So thank you so much for being here this morning. We really appreciated your comments and your time, and we look forward to this ongoing conversation with each of you. Thank you so much.